So I'm going to talk about uh, immune activation and HIV. Um, and to set the stage, um, uh, I'd like to uh, first review what the life expectancy of your average HIV-infected individual living in the modern era looks like. So if you're an average 20-year-old uh, living with HIV now, the life expectancy is now um, uh, up to 53 years or uh, expected to live to the age of 73 or so in the general population. These are data from uh, the Kaiser database uh, in, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, it's, it's still quite a bit lower than the general population in the age and gender matched uh, by about 12 years. Um, uh, but if you restrict the people who started ART at a very high T cell count, above 500, don't have hepatitis B or C, don't smoke or use drugs, um, you can narrow that gap to about six years or so. And so you really do start to approach the life expectancy of the general population. That's a remarkable uh, achievement uh, uh, of uh, antiretroviral therapy in the modern era, but, um, but, but a gap still remains. Um, and if you start, you know, you know, removing all these people, you know, who have viral hepatitis, smoking, you're left with only a minority of people with HIV that fit these criteria. So most people living with HIV today did start ART at a lower uh, T cell count, and that uh, has a profound effect on life expectancy. These data are from the NA Accord study in North America, uh, plotting life expectancy, uh, again, for a 20-year-old. Um, uh, and uh, what you can stratify by major uh, CD4 count, what you can see uh, is that uh, there's about a 20-year gap uh, in life expectancy for people who start at a CD4 count above uh, uh, 350 uh, versus uh, uh, below uh, 350. Uh, that's a remarkable decreased life expectancy associated with delayed antiretroviral therapy. And that's important because the vast majority of the people around the world, the 20 million or so who are on ART right now around the world, they started at a low CD4 <coughs> count. So we're going to be dealing with this problem of uh, diminished life expectancy uh, uh, for a long time uh, to come. And it's not just diminished life expectancy, but it's also uh, increased uh, age-related morbidities that we see in the modern antiretroviral therapy era. And I, I've given you a list uh, here, cardiovascular disease, non-AIDS, uh, cancers, osteoporotic fractures, um, COPD or lung disease, liver disease, kidney disease, you name it, down the list. Um, lots of diseases, uh, even frailty, a, syndr a syndrome of multimorbidity and functional decline that we normally only think about uh, in much older populations. Um, uh, we're seeing in younger people living with HIV, particularly those who started ART at very advanced disease stages. And it's not just having one of these diseases. Um, people living with HIV, particularly over the age of 50, um, uh, tend to accumulate multiple uh, morbidities. And so these are data from the AGE HIV cohort uh, in Amsterdam at a pretty good, uh, pretty well matched uh, um, HIV uninfected uh, control group. Uh, and they stratify the number of morbidities that uh, people were living with uh, by age. And you can see uh, there's a lot more people with two or three morbidities once you get over the age of 50 in the HIV infected group uh, versus the HIV uninfected uh, uh, group. So it's really multi-morbidity is, uh, is quite common uh, in, in the clinic these days. So one might simply ask whether HIV accelerates the aging process. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't think that's exactly right. Uh, and a good example to demonstrate this is uh, looking at cancer. Uh, so HIV does, in fact, increase the risk of many different cancers, in particular, uh, infection-related cancers. Uh, so if you look at the risk of uh, the incidence of uh, uh, infection-related cancers in HIV in red, uh, compared to the general population stratified by age, uh, you see this persistently increased risk. Uh, uh, anywhere from uh, a two to an eight-fold uh, increased risk depending um, uh, on the age category. Uh, Smoking-related cancers are also um, uh, increased uh, in HIV. Um, uh, but this is not accelerated aging because the, the curves aren't separating as you, as you get uh, 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 toward higher ages. If anything, they're coming closer together. Uh, and that's what that purple line you see 
uh, shows. That's the risk in HIV compared to the general population. The relative risk is actually declining a little bit as the risk increases at advanced ages in the general population. So it's more accentuated aging across uh, different age categories, not accelerated aging in HIV. And it's also true that it's not all uh, age-related cancers that are increased in HIV. Uh, for example, very common age-related malignancies like prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, they're not increased at all uh, in people living with HIV. These uh, curves are overlapping. Um, uh, this, uh, and these are data from a, a population-based uh, study in uh, uh, Denmark, uh, uh, to, so you know, quite, quite robust uh, uh, data. Um, uh, and there really no evidence uh, uh, for an increased risk. Uh, so there are specific diseases that are increased in HIV, not all age-related uh, uh, complications. Um, and uh, you also get a, a signal of this infection-related uh, complications uh, from uh, the START trial. Uh, so uh, everyone remembers that early ART profoundly decreases the risk uh, of uh, AIDS-related events and even non-AIDS-related events. Um, but if you look closely, the, the biggest impact were really on infection-related uh, uh, morbidities, um, tuberculosis, bacterial infections, and also infection-related cancers. Those were really uh, uh, diminished by early initiation of ART. But even in people who started ART immediately at a high CD4 count, um, they still have a persistently uh, abnormal risk of even AIDS events. There's a 1% risk of AIDS in people starting ART immediately at a high CD4 count. That's not normal. Um, and uh, a similar inference comes from uh, the Temprano study, uh, also a study of uh, early ART uh, done in Western Africa, uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire here. And, and while early ART profoundly decreased the risk of uh, mostly tuberculosis-related complications and mortality in this setting, um, there was still a 5 to 7 percent risk uh, uh, of mostly tuberculosis-related uh, uh, outcomes out at uh, 30 months uh, of therapy, even in people who started immediately at a high T cell count. That's much higher uh, rates of tuberculosis and mortality than we see in the general population uh, in this setting. Um, and there was even a mortality benefit of six months of INH prophylaxis in this study, regardless of uh, CD4 count. Uh, which is really profound. Uh, I took INH uh, when I was uh, a, a college uh, student. I worked as a phlebotomist in the summers uh, in the hospital, and I got exposed to tuberculosis and converted my PPD. Never once did I think that that six months of INH was actually going to reduce my mortality risk over the next 30 months. But that's what was observed here. There's a profound risk of infectious complications, particularly in communities where there's high prevalence of TB, that persists even among people who start ART early. This point is further driven home in data from South Africa, um, uh, showing uh, uh, whoops, uh, uh, a dramatically increased risk uh, uh, of tuberculosis in people uh, treated uh, with antiretroviral therapy for over five years compared to the un HIV uninfected population. Uh, and there's even a threefold higher risk in the general population when you restrict the people with CD4 counts above 700. Uh, so uh, there's still this uh, 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 subtle but real um, uh, immunodeficiency that persists um, and is really notable in areas where you have high TB uh, prevalence. But other complications did not seem to be as dramatically affected by early ART uh, and may not have even you know, uh, been increased by HIV uh, in the early stages. Uh, in the START study, there wasn't a lot of evidence uh, for an increased risk of cardiovascular events uh, uh, by immediate ART initiation. Uh, but if you plot the risk of cardiovascular events <coughs> in the START study, people with CD4 counts uh, largely above 500 at enrollment, uh, by the nadir CD4 count at which they started antiretroviral therapy, We'll see that most, in both groups, their nadir CD4 counts are still pretty high. Uh, but in the SMART study done a decade earlier, uh, this is a trial of interrupted uh, ART versus continued ART in people with lower CD4 counts. 
And you saw a dramatic risk of uh, increased risk of cardiovascular events and people who were interrupting the ART. There, um, and, and the, you know, the difference, uh, these, this difference emerged within six months or so of, of randomization. Uh, so uh, the difference there, I, I would say, is that while it was a slightly older population, um, uh, they had much lower nadir CD4 counts, and I think that's an important difference that we'll you know, come back to uh, later on in the talk. Um, and it's led uh, uh, myself and many others to hypothesize that some of the complications on that long list that I showed you uh, may well be low CD4 nadir diseases. They may not uh, be evident early on, uh, soon after HIV infection, but they may take some degree of disease progression before HIV truly increases their risk. Whereas other uh, diseases like infectious complications may still be evident uh, even in people who start early. So it's a more nuanced view of um, uh, uh, accentuated aging in HIV. But why is all this stuff happening? So um, surely lifestyle factors are important. People living with HIV may be more likely to smoke, use drugs. Um, uh, there may be direct toxicities of the antiretrovirals that we use. Um, this is less of an issue than it used to be, uh, but it's uh, always still a potential uh, issue that we need to consider. But um, we've thought a lot about the role of the immune system and persistent inflammation in driving this risk over the last you know, decade or so. Um, and we thought about this uh, because of an important clue from nature. Um, on the left, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the Sudi Mangani monkey. Uh, this is the natural host of the simian immunodeficiency virus where one of the strains of HIV came from, uh, found in Western Africa. Uh, these monkeys, when naturally infected with SIV, experienced high levels of virus replication, as high if not higher than we see in HIV-infected people, yet this monkey doesn't get sick from the disease. It does not get immunodeficiency. But the same virus in a different monkey, in this case the rhesus macaque on the right, experiences comparable levels of virus replication uh, to the Sudi Mangabe. Uh, but experiences rapid clinical progression to AIDS and death. Uh, so you get immunodeficiency in this case. The difference is uh, between the two monkeys is not the virus. The virus is exactly the same. Rather, it's the response of the immune system to the virus that determines how rapidly the monkeys progress. The monkey on the left that doesn't get sick has minimal levels of systemic immune activation in the chronic phase of the infection, whereas the, mon the monkey on the right that does get sick has massive levels of generalized immune activation. And not just the B cells and the T cells that are uh, specifically responding to HIV or SIV antigens, but the entire, H uh, the entire T cell and B cell um, uh, population gets non-specifically activated. The innate immune system also gets activated. And the more of that you have, the more rapidly you progress. It's true with the monkeys. It's also true with HIV-infected people. And uh, we and many other groups, including Sharon Moon here in Melbourne, uh, David Cooper, John Saunders in, in Sydney, um, showed many years ago that, um, that one marker of immune activation, T cell activation, uh, declines uh, dramatically uh, during suppressive antiretroviral therapy in green. Uh, uh, but it fails to normalize compared to HIV uninfected individuals in blue, despite years of, of treatment mediated viral suppression. Um, and uh, other markers of innate immune activation and inflammation also remain abnormal, and what's more, they predict disease. Uh, and so the Insight Network really kicked off this field, I would say about a year ago, uh, a decade ago, um, uh, from uh, data in the SMART, uh, uh, in the SMART study, uh, but uh, using uh, the uh, data from the control arms uh, from that study and the Esprit and Silcat studies, these are individuals with HIV uh, who maintained uh, viral suppression on antiretroviral therapy largely for up to a decade. Um, uh, and a single measurement of the inflammatory marker IL-6 and the coagulation marker D-dimer uh, uh, predicted uh, the subsequent risk of disease dramatically. Uh, so those that had the highest levels in the top quartile had an over 20% risk of a serious non-AIDS event, a uh, heart attack, uh, cancer, or death, um, uh, compared to those in the lowest 
uh, two quartiles, where the risk was around 5% or so over a decade. Um, and uh, the other thing to point out here is that these curves are continuing to separate over time, suggesting that there's likely to be an inflammatory set point within individuals. Some people have high levels of inflammation that are continuing uh, to experience risk over time, whereas others have low levels of inflammation and are probably okay, probably don't have uh, a lot of ri excess risk of disease. And the same thing was seen in the START trial. Uh, the event rate was a lot lower. Uh, there were a lot fewer uh, uh, um, uh, uh, clinical uh, morbidities, you know, uh, heart attacks and, and the like in this, um, uh, in this study. But the relationship between inflammation uh, and morbidity and mortality was almost identical. Uh, so the people in the top two quartiles had high risk and the bottom two quartiles had low risk. And the hazard ratios were almost identical. It's really remarkable, actually, if you, uh, if you think about it. Um, but the relationship between inflammation and disease is, is consistent, whether you start er early or late. But if I was to summarize our field's goal right now uh, in the inflammation agenda, it is to move people uh, who are currently in the top two quartiles, the high levels of inflammation, into the bottom two quartiles. That's what we as a field need to do. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about strategies about how to do that. So we, we know from the, the Insight Network that inflammation predicts disease. Um, it's also true for specific diseases all the way down the list. Many, all the way down the list. Uh, many of the diseases I listed on the earlier slide uh, have now been as, uh, linked uh, to this persistent inflammatory state in HIV, including frailty uh, uh, down here, that syndrome of multimorbidity. And um, you know, Clovis Palmer's group recently had a publication linking immune activation uh, uh, to this. Uh, so, so I think um, uh, there's a, a large consensus in the field that inflammation is likely important in many of these diseases. So how can we reduce it? Uh, well, uh, in the clinic right now, we don't have any proven interventions to reduce inflammation that also improve health. Uh, but what we do know works is lifestyle interventions. Uh, and um, we know, uh, based on work uh, from Kerry Althoff and the NA Accord group, uh, that traditional risk factors for heart attacks, myocardial infarction, uh, play probably a much greater role than the inflammatory state in your average person living with HIV. Uh, the att population attributable risk uh, uh, of, uh, of, of heart disease is largely driven by smoking, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. These are things that we can modify. We can encourage our patients um, uh, to quit smoking. We can encourage people uh, to, uh, to better control the high blood pressure, control the cholesterol. These are things that we, we can do in, you know, in the general medicine practice. Um, uh, we don't do as, as good of a job as we should, uh, many studies uh, show, uh, in the HIV treating community uh, doing, uh, doing this, uh, controlling these traditional risk factors, but, but it's clearly important for reducing risk. And we got really good news from the DAD study um, uh, in Europe uh, about quitting smoking. And pe there's people living with HIV who are able to quit smoking by five years. Um, your risk of cancer has declined uh, uh, to that of never smokers in this cohort. Uh, uh, whereas those who had only more recently uh, uh, you know, quit smoking, they still had an elevated risk. So this really it provides a strong impetus to really get people to really focus on quitting smoking. It makes a huge difference for cancer and also, of course, heart disease and many of the other complications uh, on the list. Moderate exercise also appears to decrease inflammation. The very stuff that I showed you in the plot that predicts disease, well, a lot of these biomarkers uh, can be reduced by simply walking briskly three times a week for 60 minutes. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good intervention right there, uh, and it doesn't cost any money. Um, so uh, this is a recent data uh, from an Italian, uh, uh, an Italian group. It's an uncontrolled uh, trial, uh, but there are a lot of other trials like this in the, in the aging literature in, in people without HIV uh, uh, that, that show the same thing. And so uh, exercise probably has a lot of great benefits, and we should be recommending it to our uh, patients. <coughs> 
So, uh, but this begs the question it, as to whether the relationship between inflammation and end organ disease and treated HIV is just simply explained by all these other health related behaviors. Is it just the smoking and the injection of drugs and all the other things, sedentary lifestyle, uh, that is really explaining this increased risk? Well, I don't think that's likely to be the case. Um, and the best uh, uh, example uh, to um, uh, to refute that uh, hypothesis comes from uh, the Copenhagen uh, cohort, um, uh, Knudsen uh, and colleagues. Um, uh, they uh, did a very large study, over a thousand individuals filed forward in time, uh, performed a single measurement of the immune activation marker Cybel CD163. It predicted increased mortality in that population. But since it was so big, they were able to do subset analyses and look for interactions. Uh, uh, and what they found was that uh, it was the non-injection drug users that where, where they saw a stronger association between immune activation and mortality uh, than the injection drug users. It predicted mortality in both groups. It was just stronger in the non-injection drug users. So it wasn't that injection drug use was explaining this uh, immune activation signal. The same thing was seen with smoking. The relationship between immune activation and mortality was actually stronger among not never smokers than it was uh, among smokers. Uh, so, um, so I think this tells us that this gives us a little hint uh, that the mechanisms by which HIV is increasing immune activation may really be contributing to risk. And while it's true that IDU and smoking also increase immune activation, the pathways by which it does so are not really contributing to risk in the same way. IDU and, and, uh, and smoking contribute to mortality in massive ways but through other mechanisms. It's not inflammation, it's drug overdoses and other things, for example, a direct uh, uh, heart, uh, heart disease risk from smoking, but it's not the inflammation of the smoking that's uh, driving things. So I do think, you know, the theme of the World AIDS Day, everybody counts. Uh, so. If a patient comes into my clinic and is currently smoking, the focus is on getting them to quit smoking. It's not an inflammatory intervention. But if I have a non-smoker in my clinic who's never used IDU, yet has um, a signature of inflammation, multiple chronic morbidities, they really do probably have an inflammatory um, a disease that needs addressing. So what's our uh, initial therapeutic strategy to manage uh, um, uh, that low level inflammation in such cases? Well, I call this the low lying fruit strategy uh, that the field is starting out with. Um, uh, we've been tested in commonly used drugs with anti-inflammatory properties. And if they improve biomarkers of immune activation and pilot clinical trials, they, they get advanced to clinical endpoint trials. There have been a number of such studies that uh, perform um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, have been uh, attested uh, and largely with negative uh, results thus far. Uh, our own group uh, in the ACTG had done a, a study of two doses of aspirin, uh, a low dose and a high dose aspirin level. And while quite effective at reducing cyclooxygenase activity, the direct effect of aspirin, it had absolutely no effect on any immune activation biomarker we tested. This is soluble CD14, but I can show you any other biomarker, including D-dimer, the, the coagulation uh, uh, marker. No effect there, and no, no effect on uh, flow-mediated dilatation uh, uh, biomarker of um, uh, uh, vascular disease. And so, in this case, these low-lying fruit interventions didn't seem to uh, reverse the uh, inflammatory state that we care about. But in other cases, statins uh, have shown a profound uh, a promise. Uh, so, uh, this is Grace McComsey's uh, a study uh, of rosuvastatin, uh, where she showed uh, a significant reduction in soluble CD14. Uh, also, uh, activated monocyte populations were reduced in that study. Um, Janet Lowe and Steve Grinspoon's group also showed actual plaque regression, uh, uh, so uh, atherosclerotic plaque regression with atorvastatin uh, in a, a, a trial of, uh, among people living with HIV. So, so statins really uh, showed some promise, uh, and that led to a large clinical endpoint uh, uh, trial that's uh, nearly fully enrolled. Uh, there are actually 
uh, over enrolling the planned 6,500 uh, 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 participant sample size because the event rate is actually lower than they had uh, initially expected. Um, uh, but this will test whether among people who don't otherwise need a statin uh, living with HIV, uh, whether a, a statin actually reduces cardiovascular events. Um, and I think even more important in this study will be whether statins reduce cancer, osteoporotic fractures, you know, things that we don't normally associate with cholesterol levels. I, I think that would be a much more compelling uh, um, uh, data suggesting a potential role of the inflammatory state uh, in contributing to disease. But what if statins are not enough? And this is what I spend most of my time thinking about. I personally lost a number of uh, patients who were already on statins and an aspirin uh, to sudden cardiac death, among other uh, uh, morbidities. Uh, and I think that there, we need additional interventions. Um, uh, and we need, I think we need to start by addressing the root causes of the inflammatory state during ART. And the obvious place to start uh, looking is the virus itself. We know that HIV persists. Uh, it's uh, in, in, in uh, reservoirs, uh, despite uh, antiretroviral therapy, those reservoirs are uh, established in the first week uh, of HIV infection and persist for the lifetime uh, of, uh, of the person. Uh, and if you use an ultra-sensitive assay to look for the virus, uh, as Sarah Palmer, Frank Maldarelli, and many others have, you can find it using a very sensitive assay in plasma. Most of that virus we detect likely reflects release of virus from infected cells uh, without ongoing rounds of productive replication, although this remains a controversial area in the field. Uh, there likely are some small you know, uh, 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 pockets of reinfection in the tissues that, uh, that occur, but most of what we measure in the plasma is just coming out of cells. And that's important to recognize because we lack any interventions that block this process. We don't have any drugs that block HIV expression from cells. All of our drugs block new rounds of replication. But they don't turn off the tap. Uh, and that HIV expression from cells is likely to be uh, a key determinant uh, of some of the uh, inflammation that we see. Um, and uh, most of that is probably occurring in the tissues, not in the blood, which is uh, much easier to measure. Uh, I like showing this. Uh, 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 a slide from Tim Shacker's group. Uh, he had performed an analytic treatment interruption uh, in, um, uh, in individuals who were otherwise suppressed on antiretroviral therapy, measured the viral load several times a week um, in the first few weeks after stopping uh, therapy. And at the very minute the viral load just became detectable, uh, they did a lymph node biopsy and gut biopsies and then put people immediate, immediately back on therapy. And when they looked at those biopsies and stained for evidence of the virus and lymph nodes and in the tissues, when the viral load was exceptionally low in the plasma, there was gobs and gobs of virus everywhere you looked in the tissue, suggesting that uh, it was really the tissue uh, uh, was, the, was likely to be the primary source of the rebounding virus. And that likely all the time, even during suppressive antiretroviral therapy, there's low level virus coming out of cells in those tissues. Um, and it's important to think about these anatomic compartments and what their functions uh, typically are. So HIV is releasing in the same anatomic compartments where adaptive immune responses are supposed to be developed in the lymph nodes. Uh, um, you're supposed to develop immune responses in the lymph nodes, and if there's inflammation in that compartment and uh, fibrosis, so you can imagine that um, a virus could potentially interfere with the uh, uh, formation of healthy immune responses. Um, now, it's also true that HIV can infect other cell types in the body, uh, macrophages, myeloid cells, and those can be all throughout the body, in the brain, in the fat, in the liver. Um, uh, this, uh, the ability of the virus to infect those types of cells typically only happens at more advanced stages of disease, not necessarily during the earliest uh, stages of the infection. But I think that may be important when we start thinking about the, uh, the relationship between drivers of immune activation uh, and end organ disease complications. What about other viruses besides HIV? Uh, so. Uh, my own group uh, has been very interested in CMV, asymptomatic CMV replication contributing to immune activation. As I'll talk about in a moment, we're coming back to this in a big way. Uh, several years ago, we published a study showing that 
uh, treating people with valgancyclovir for eight weeks uh, uh, who have suboptimal T cell recovery during therapy um, uh, results in a significant reduction in T cell activation. Um, subsequently, uh, 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 Sharon Walmsley's uh, group in Canada had done a trial of valacyclovir. Uh, that drug uh, uh, gets uh, herpes simplex virus one and two, but at the dosages used does not get CMV very well. Um, and that, uh, that study failed to decrease immune activation, really any uh, marker they looked at. Um, and so we infer from this that uh, the valgancyclovir effect that we observed uh, it was probably a, 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 a result of suppressing CMV as opposed to other herpes viruses. We don't know that for sure, uh, but we think that's likely to be true. And in the ensuing years, uh, many groups have gone on to link uh, asymptomatic CMV replication, or surrogate markers of CMV activity like IgG levels uh, or um, T cell responses to uh, end organ disease in HIV. Uh, and in this uh, 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 study from uh, an Italian group, the Icona cohort, um, while CMV serostatus uh, did not really predict uh, to a great degree uh, the risk of AIDS-related events, uh, it had a, a pretty significant impact uh, on non-AIDS uh, related events. Uh, CMV seropositives had a much higher risk uh, of disease after adjusting for other confounders. And the strongest effect was for cardiovascular events uh, where the hazard ratio was 2.3, which is pretty impressive. Um, uh, and this is important to note because CMV replicates in vascular endothelium and contributes, we think contributes to transplant vasculopathy and people undergoing solid organ transplantation and are immunosuppressed uh, in that situation. Uh, CMV causes this concentric atherosclerosis that's quite uh, uh, um, progressive and, and gancyclovir seems to really suppress that. Um, um, and uh, we think in the context of HIV that this may uh, play a greater role in individuals with lower nadir CD4 count to have had more uh, immunodeficiency and more activity of CMV uh, over the years. Um, but all of this, uh, these and many other studies uh, like it have um, really gotten us wondering whether CMV might be contributing to a lot of the disease manifestations we see in people with low nadirs like heart disease. Um, and, and now that there are newer drugs um, uh, available that have fewer toxicities, um, uh, we've gone back to our earlier uh, trial of allogancyclovir and start on the, the plasma samples and started addressing other biomarkers that strongly predict mortality and cardiovascular disease events. Um, uh, we started with uh, soluble TNF receptor 2 um, uh, because it's strongly associated with CMV serostatus and was the strongest predictor of uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks uh, in an ACTG study that we recently did. Um, and we saw a dramatic effect of albumin cyclovir. It declined by an entire quartile. Uh, so if you remember to that early slide, what our field's goal is, is to get people in the top two quartiles into the bottom two. This seemed to do that, at least for this biomarker. Um, uh, and this, uh, if you link this to the observational data in the Tenorio ACTG study, this effect size is equivalent to an approximately 50% reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction. It's a massive effect. Now you never see this, you know, this never translates what you see in an observational study to an interventional study. So I doubt we would see quite this um, uh, effect size, um, uh, but it at least gives you a sense that uh, we might be, you know, uh, on the right track here, that CMV might be uh, plausibly contributing uh, significantly to the disease. Uh, we went on to look at another biomarker, and this is just, these data are just about 10 days old or so. Um, uh, uh, soluble CD163, uh, I showed you that data from the Copenhagen cohort earlier. Um, uh, this biomarker also uh, uh, strongly associated with vascular inflammation by FDG PET um, imaging by the you know, Grinspoon group. Uh, this also was significantly reduced by valgan cyclovir in our study. So we're, uh, we've also looked at other markers of vascular uh, function. ICAM uh, also uh, was significantly reduced in this trial. So we're starting to think that uh, a CMV may uh, well be doing a lot uh, underneath the hood uh, and uh, targeting it may be a viable therapeutic strategy. Another uh, target uh, for uh, interventions is microbial translocation or the leaky gut syndrome. 
Uh, many of you have heard this story before. The, uh, Jason Bremschle and Danny Duick defined this over a decade ago. On the top is a, uh, a, a healthy gut. Uh, the pink ribbon is a, an intact gut epithelial barrier. Uh, those blue risotto-like particles are bacteria in the lumen of the gut that are being kept out of the systemic circulation. And behind that brick wall, you have uh, an intact um, uh, mucosal immune uh, system. But in HIV, in the first week uh, of the infection, you have dramatic uh, depletion uh, of um, uh, CD4 T cells uh, from the lamina propria of the gut. And not just uh, overall T cells, but specific T cell subsets like Th17, Th22 cells that play an important role in maintaining gut barrier uh, integrity. Uh, those are lost very early on, uh, which leads to disrupted gut epithelial barriers, um, uh, epithelial cell apoptosis, and translocation of those gut bacteria and, and bacterial products, which can contribute to immune activation. And our own group has um, uh, looked at the, uh, the response to this microbial translocation in situ using um, uh, a uh, myeloproxidase stain with Jake Estes, who I understand was here a couple of years ago for this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, so he did this staining uh, uh, for myeloproxidase in the lamina propria. And what you see in someone without HIV, there's very little of that uh, in here. There's um, very little neutrophil response because there's not much microbial translocation happening. Uh, but even in people who are suppressed on antiretroviral therapy, uh, with a high CD4 count, there's still quite a bit of this uh, neutrophil response to microbial products, uh, and particularly in people who have uh, so-called immunologic non-responders, people with persistently low T cells despite therapy, we see a lot of that. So um, having, uh, uh, you know, delaying ART uh, and um, uh, having persistently low T cells uh, seems to be associated with quite a lot of microbial translocation. And um, markers of gut barrier um, integrity also seem to uh, significantly predict mortality in our hands. These are data from the SOCA uh, cohort where this intestinal fatty acid binding protein and zonulin, uh, which um, uh, goes uh, down uh, as a consequence uh, of HIV and peripheral blood. Um, and they both strongly predicted mortality in our hands. And so uh, really a suggestion uh, that microbial translocation really could be contributing. Unfortunately, all the studies that have been done so far to try and reduce microbial translocation in HIV have failed. Uh, none of them have been effective. Rifaximin, Sevelimer, bovine clostrum, probiotics, prebiotics, and you name it, we haven't had a successful intervention yet. Uh, many of us are still trying, but it's, um, but it's uh, 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 perhaps because there are so many defects uh, that need to be reversed, uh, we may need a multi-pronged intervention to reverse this. You can also look at this um, uh, list of all these biomarkers that uh, predict mortality and then scratch your head, well, gosh, where the heck are we going to intervene? If we can't intervene directly on this root cause of microbial translocation, how do we choose an interventional target? And so I've been thinking about immune activation lately like a tree. So the leaves are the end organ diseases, the various end organ diseases that are, that are increased, particularly in people with, uh, who started at a low nature or CD4 count. The roots are the multiple root drivers of the inflammatory state uh, that give rise on, uh, uh, to inflammation. And the branches uh, are the many uh, inflammatory pathways that contribute to disease, and there are many of them. Um, and if you think about intervening on any one of those branches or one root, I think of this as like the whack-a-mole problem. And you've seen this cartoon game, or this uh, arcade game, right? You, you, you knock down the mole over here and right over there another one pops up. And so, and there are great examples of this in the HIV literature. So uh, some of my colleagues in the ACTG recently did a study of chloroquine. It's an anti-malarial compound that also has anti-inflammatory properties. It blocks toll-like receptors. Um, and when given to people who were untreated, uh, and didn't uh, have ART on board, it actually increased HIV viral load. So they were unable to observe any anti-inflammatory anti benefit because the virus, you know, got worse. They blocked uh, a protective antiviral response. And so there are likely to be several examples of this when we intervene at specific um, uh, inflammatory pathways and, and don't 
aren't mindful of what's happening uh, to the underlying root drivers. And so um, many of us have wondered whether we could identify a tree trunk. Um, is there a common um, early inflammatory pathway that's driven by all of these root drivers and gives rise to all these downstream consequences? And, and, and many have hypothesized that things like the DAC-STAT pathway, uh, the IL-1 beta pathway, uh, both of which have specific inhibitors that are FDA approved, um, uh, might be uh, contributing. And we've also wondered about the IDO pathway. But, um, but, um, but when we consider these uh, pathways, again, we need to make sure that we're not uh, interfering with effective antiviral responses against things like CMV that might make things worse, whackable. Um, and let's unpack one of these, IL-1 beta inhibitors, because these have gotten a lot of press lately. Uh, this is actually one of the, this is a, a big deal in the cardiovascular world and the inflammation world in general. Uh, this uh, a study, Cantos, done among people with, uh, without HIV, uh, but severe heart disease that were already on statins and, and, and the like. Uh, and they were given an IL-1 beta inhibitor, this uh, anti-inflammatory drug, canakinumab. Um, and that drug profoundly reduced the C-reactive protein levels as expected, it decreased inflammation, uh, but it also decreased cardiovascular events. This is the first proof uh, that blocking inflammation decreased the chronic disease, in this case, uh, uh, heart disease. Um, the earlier studies of statins, people argued they had anti-inflammatory benefits, but other people said, oh, it's just all the cholesterol lowering, and you're unable to sort of tease it out. Here's definitive proof that inflammation causes disease. Uh, it also reduced uh, uh, death from lung cancer. Uh, so it was doing a lot of other <coughs> protective uh, things as well. And it has been now studied in HIV by colleague Priscilla Shu at, at San Francisco General did a pilot study among 10 individuals who treated HIV, um, gave a single dose of canakinumab. Um, uh, it reduced uh, CRP levels, it's similar to what you saw in the, uh, in the HIV uninfected study. Sorry, the numbers are a little bit off here on this slide, uh, but IL-6 levels also uh, were uh, reduced uh, significantly. And, and the reduction uh, it was about a 30% reduction in IL-6 levels. And that might, of course, find to about a 25% decreased risk of non-AIDS events in that uh, Tenorio study I mentioned. So a pretty significant uh, uh, clinical, uh, uh, potential clinical impact. Uh, but is it a viable intervention in HIV? So there was an increased risk of fatal infections and sepsis with kenakinumab in the, in the HIV uninfected trial, the Canto study. And so that's a real concern uh, in, the, in the setting of HIV where there is, we think, this increased risk of other infections. Um, uh, and um, uh, we have to be concerned about potential negative consequences there on immune function. And we also don't know whether it, the adaptive immune defects that we know persist in treated HIV would necessarily be reversed by this particular anti-inflammatory approach. And at least the preliminary data from Dr. Shu's study uh, don't show any uh, change in T cell activation levels. And so most of the signature is on minus monocytes and innate cells. And so it's unclear whether this is truly a tree trunk, uh, tree trunk intervention or just another branch. Um, and so that's gotten me to think whether our tree is actually a banyan tree. Um, and maybe, um, maybe there are multiple um, uh, trunks. And, you know, I, I showed this slide se you know, several months ago for the first time to a smaller you know, group of people. And since then, I've, I've started to think about the banyan tree and read about it a little bit more. And the more I think this is an apt analogy to what's happening in HIV, so these secondary trunks over here <clears throat> are, are not trunks that are spontaneously rising up out of the ground. They're actually aerial roots that <laughs> descend uh, uh, from uh, branches from the initial trunk. And so this, this is a lot like what we think HIV may be doing, right? HIV is the primary trunk that's coming up and giving rise to all these problems. Microbial translocation makes CMV worse. And those things are new aerial roots that establish new water supplies and are now new um, uh, inflammatory drivers that we need to worry about. Um, and so I think this is uh, starting to fit together. And then lastly, 
the way we're thinking about this in terms of the Nader CD4 count and the disease manifestations, um, it could be that HIV itself uh, uh, is a, a major contributor to adaptive immune defects. As I mentioned earlier, it's specifically being released in the anatomic compartments where adaptive immune responses are supposed to develop. And uh, those reservoirs of HIV are established very early, in the first week or two of the infection. Um, and so even in people who started a high T cell count, there's still quite a bit of HIV there uh, in the tissues um, that could uh, potentially contribute um, to adaptive immune defects. Um, microbial translocation, while it's evident at the very early stages, the degree to which it's irreversible with therapy uh, isn't really uh, that dramatic until you start getting to a lower nadir uh, CD4 counts. And, and that, of course, gets showered around through the vasculature, you know, potentially contributing to multiple morbidities. HIV and myeloid cells, to the degree that that persists <coughs> during suppressive antiretroviral therapy, and that's a <coughs> an ongoing controversy, but, but certainly the degree to which they infect myeloid cells, that's a later stage um, uh, problem in HIV. <clears throat> and I'd expect it only to uh, be evident in people of lower Nader CD4 counts, and that may be why we see such a strong relationship between Nader CD4 count and uh, CNS disease, neurocognitive dysfunction, uh, 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 cardiac disease, uh, metabolic disease, and, and, and liver disease. Um, and then CMV, because it replicates in the vasculature, perhaps um, uh, it may be a putative um, driver of vascular disease uh, in, in the setting of HIV, and, and likely to be more of a factor of people with lower naters. This is all just a hypothesis, but the current way that we're starting to think about this. So to summarize, immune activation strongly predicts increased morbidity and mortality in treated HIV, particularly those infectious complications and infection-related <coughs> cancers, which are evident even in people who start early. Lifestyle interventions are important. We can do this in the clinic now, and it will save lives. Uh, and this is something that we need to be very mindful of uh, as, as clinicians. Um, <clears throat> but in addition to that, I think we need to look for novel ways to intervene on inflammation and sensible to prioritize those interventions targeting the root causes. We have newer agents for CMV that are on the horizon, but we uh, need effective interventions to block HIV expression from cells. Uh, we don't have any right now. Uh, and uh, we also need uh, better uh, treatments for microbial translocation. And while we hope to find the tree trunk, it's possible our tree is a banyan. Uh, and if that's the case, um, it may mean uh, that there's going to be a broader spectrum of root drivers of the inflammatory state and disease manifestations than those of, those of low Nader CD4 counts. And we may need individualized approaches to care, so everyone counts. You know, some people may need one intervention, other people may need different types of, of interventions. So with that, I'll, I'll close by acknowledging my collaborator, collaborators, the people who contributed to the work, um, and all of the funders, and I'll take your questions. Thank you.